I'm Marsha Rosenbaum, Director Emerita of the Drug Policy Alliance office in San Francisco and founder of our Safety First project. Um, I am by training a sociologist and so I was, uh, apart from being surprised 10 minutes ago when Ethan asked me to chair this plenary, I was, <laughs> I was delighted um, to be asked um, for this particular plenary, Drug Set and Setting Today, because Norman Zinberg's seminal work, 40, published 40 years ago now, Drug Set and Setting, provided the foundation for our, as academics, understanding of drug use and guided much of our research. Today, we are gonna hear from three brilliant thinkers, writers, who write about, think about, drugs, consciousness, and society, who stand out as authors who are able to reach beyond academic audiences and into, shall I say, more conventional America um, with this import, these important kinds of ways of thinking. So, our first speaker is my friend Julie Holland, who is Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. She is the author of Weekends at Bellevue, where she was on staff for a number of years. Also, a very important book called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, a comprehensive look at the risks and benefits of MDMA. And most recently, The Pot Book, A Complete Guide to Cannabis. She is also, I'm happy to tell you, and always surprised when I see her, a regular on the Today Show. Um, where she, and she's been on the Today Show 21 times, where I've watched her deftly manage to slip the concept of harm reduction into an otherwise conventional and a little bit unenlightened, I might add, discussions about drugs. So, Julie. Um, Marsha, you just took my notes, and that seems a little... Marsha? Marsha, darling? Marsha? You took, you took my notes. <laughs> I'm going to get her back. I don't know how. Am I going to get you back, Marsha? Um, so I just have, like, five sort of points I want to make. Um, in 15 minutes or less. Um, the first one is I, I'm, a, I'm a parent of two kids, 11 and 7, and um, I've learned a lot about parenting, and uh, because of my children have taught me well. Um, and I've started to look at the way our government treats drug policy as sort of exceptionally bad parenting. Um, if there's something that I am worried about my kids taking or using because it might be bad for them, then I talk to them about it and I say, you know, this is daddy's chainsaw and it's dangerous, but if you need to cut down a tree, this is the tool that you need. So you gotta read the manual and know how it works and make sure you wear your goggles if you're gonna use it and make sure you've got somebody else around and blah, 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 blah. What I don't say is, don't touch this and it's gonna be up here and you can't touch it. Cause then my kid will climb up there to get it and they'll cut themselves with a chainsaw. So I don't mean to suggest that drugs are as dangerous as chainsaws. Um, what I mean is that, you know, our government doesn't, they're not honest with us about what the drugs do and what they don't do and how dangerous they are and how not dangerous they are. Um, they make it impossible for us to tell other people what we know because they won't let us 
gather the data. I mean, this is the case certainly with the NIDA monopoly in, on cannabis where, um, you know, the government spends all this time saying that, you know, there's no proof that, that cannabis is a medicine, um, but they won't let us prove that cannabis is a medicine, even though we all know it is. And, you know, up until 1937, everybody knew it was. Um, you know, cannabis is an ancient medicinal plant. And it wasn't until alcohol was made legal and there was this whole machinery in place for something else to be illegal that they turned cannabis into marijuana. Um, I don't like to call it marijuana because I just feel like it's sort of a, like a racial slur. And it, um, you know, it becoming illegal had a lot to do with xenophobia and it had everything to do with corporate greed. And it had nothing to do with what was best for the populace. Um, and unfortunately, I feel like that's still really the case today where our, our drug policy is based on uh, secrecy and hiding and lying and shame. I'm a psychiatrist, I care about shame. Um, I'm a Jew, I care about guilt. <laughs> and, you know, the way our drug policy is set up now, um, it's basically turning us into addicts. We have to hide, we have to lie, we can't be honest and open about our own use. We can't teach other people what we've learned about our use. Um, all the hiding and the shame and the lying and the secrecy so that we don't get caught adds this whole layer of adrenaline onto it, which actually sort of increases the drug-like experience. It, it makes it more addictive. Uh, it, it fetishizes it. You know, we've got, and um, I understand that here in California you don't have that, but where I am in New York, we very much have that. We have to hide. Um, and you know, I really, I love the idea of outing, and I think, I really feel like a lot of our drug policy issues are sort of human rights issues, it's civil rights issues, and you know, in the same way that Harvey Milk felt that everybody who was gay needed to stand up and say, I'm gay, you know someone who's gay, you're working with someone who's gay, and I really feel like we have to do that with, with pot, you know, that if everybody who was a, a pot smoker could stand up and say they were, I do feel like it would help the momentum even more. Um, the problem is that not all of us can do that. I mean, some of us live in communities where we can't do that, and some of us have professions where we can't do that. But um, ideally, if everyone is stand up and counted, I think that would help sort of move things along. Um, there's this great author, Janine Roth, who, who writes about um, women and food and dieting, you know, and this idea that uh, there's good food and there's bad food and there's stuff you can have and there's stuff you can't have and so you end up sort of wanting the things you can't have and one of the things that happens with women is they don't really pay attention to their bodies and their hunger because they're told that they can't trust their bodies and their hunger and they have to sort of repress it. Um, and I think that you can adopt a lot of her policies or her theories to, to drug use and, um, you know, if we allow ourselves the things that we think we need without so much um, shame and guilt and adrenaline, it's possible we'll use it in a, in a more sort of healthy manner. Um, you know, this idea of the government being bad parents, I mean, one thing I think it's really important to, is to be honest with my kids and tell them what I know and teach them as much as I can teach them so that they can make good decisions. Um, I was watching Gossip Girl yesterday and the father had just caught his daughter in a lie and he said to her, you've already lost my trust. Do you really want to lose my respect too? And I thought, you know, that's me talking to our government. <laughs> you know, like, um, they're in a position where, you know, we could be trusting them and we could respect them and it's, it's not happening in terms of our drug policy. Um, I think that our drug policy needs to be based on compassion. And there's, you know, there's, um, you know, instead of being based on fear and secrecy and lies and hiding and shame, it needs to be, to be based on compassion and what's really best for people. Um, you know, there's millions of people who could benefit from medical cannabis who don't have access to it. I'm in New York, I can't recommend cannabis to my patients. Um, or I could say that I really think cannabis would help you with your symptoms, but then when they say, okay, great, where do I go, what do I do? And I have to say, I love this, do you know any kids? <laughs> because that's who can get the drugs. And that's crazy. You know, we have to sort of flip things around. I want, I want my patients to be able to go to a dispensary and I hope that's, that will happen soon in New York. Um, one of the things that's happening because of our drug policy now is this, this sort of nature versus synthetics thing. Um, there's things like spice and K2, there's synthetic cannabinoids. 
these, to a large degree, came, came out because of our drug policy. You know, because you can't get the plant, there's this underground market for white powders. Um, and the problem with white powders, I don't mean to discriminate, but you don't know what you have. I mean, at least when you've got cannabis in your hand, you know this is a plant, it grew on the earth, you know, it captured the energy of the sun. Um, when you have a white powder, it could be anything. And it's very dangerous, it's much more dangerous. And you know, what kills me is we had this, um, we had dr drug su survey result results come out. The, uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, they reported that methamphetamine use was cut in half, cocaine use was cut in half, cigarettes, alcohol abuse, way down. Did they rejoice? Did we all say hallelujah, this is all good and healthy? They complained because cannabis use was up slightly. And what they said was, this is Gil Kurlikowski now, People keep calling it medicine, and that's the wrong message for young people to hear. Actually, it's the truth, and that's usually the right message for kids to hear. <laughs> um, we all know that cigarettes kill 1,200 people a day, and we know that alcohol is toxic to brain cells and liver cells and is responsible for countless fatalities on roadways and is involved in domestic violence and rape and homicide and suicide. These products spend billions on advertising and they sponsor national sports teams. And that is a confusing message for our young people to hear. <clears throat> um, I'm a harm reductionist and you know, health-wise, choosing an ancient medicinal plant over an unidentified white powder is a no-brainer. And um, you know, it's just like chewing on a coca leaf as opposed to smoking crack. I mean, if you're dealing with something that's natural and in its integrated form, it's gonna be a little bit better for you than just the single synthetic compound. I mean, the thing with cannabis is it's, um, the thing I love to say is, you know, we live in very complicated times and that calls for a complicated plant. Um, cannabis has got, you know, hundreds of compounds and scores of cannabinoids, and it's complicated, and there's something called an entourage effect where it's not just the THC, but it's the THC and everything else, and the CBD, and the CBN, and all these other chemicals come together um, in you know, a symphony that creates a certain effect. And to take a THC pill and give it to somebody and think that you're giving them the same thing as the medicinal plant is um, very simple-minded and not, not very accurate. Um, one thing I said on the Today Show that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about is that I believe that it is possible to healthfully integrate altered states into one's lifestyle. That I think that people, um, people can moderate their own use. I think that acutely altered does not mean permanently impaired. Um, if you give somebody very strong pot, they know to smoke a little bit less than very weak pot. And from a harm reduction perspective, it's actually better to have a high potency medicine that you take less of. Um, you know, one of the things that's really missing in our culture is we don't have any sort of positive um, images of chronic drug users. I was, talking, I was talking to my husband about this recently and um, he's, you know, he was like, we're just like Sid and Nancy, <laughs> you know? Um, for those of you who know Sid and Nancy, we're not like Sid and Nancy. But the point is that there are couples who healthfully integrate altered states into their lives, who aren't Sid and Nancy, um, who aren't Cheech and Chong, you know, who aren't like the stone Brad Pitt on the couch in front of a bong who's like, what? And you know, it's one thing that is still really missing in our culture and in media is any sort of positive images of drug users. And again, I would come back to the outing issue where you know, more people have to be more public and vocal about the fact that they, smoke pot and have a job and that, you know, they drive the kids to soccer and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make them a complete stoner slacker if they sometimes partake. Um, we've got 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population, right? You guys have probably heard that a couple times this week. What you haven't heard, perhaps, is that we have 5% of the world's population, but we swallow 50% of the world's pills. This is not good. We, you know, we are a nation of pill poppers. Um, one out of 10 of us across the country are taking antidepressants. And in New York City, where I ply my trade, God bless them, 
uh, it's more like 40% of people are taking daily doses of antidepressants. Um, and the truth is that there's more, one, more than one way to skin a cat, and there's more than one way to treat insomnia and anxiety and depression, and it's not always a daily dose of a pharmaceutical that is the best way to really tackle these symptoms. I mean, depression and addiction, you know, these to some extent are, are spiritual issues. You know, some people are sort of spiritually bankrupt, and I think our country is sort of spiritually bankrupt. And, you know, one thing about cannabis is that it, it for a lot of people, it sort of it brings them back to now and the present, um, and it can get them more in touch with their spiritual side. So I think that in the long term, sometimes this is a better way to treat what ails you. Um, I have like a minute left, so I'm just looking to see what's really... Uh, turns out cannabis cures cancer. Didn't know if you knew this. <laughs> I didn't know this. Um, it's not just that it's good for nausea and vomiting. It actually kills cancer cells, decreases the prol proliferation. It uh, blocks angiogenesis, which is uh, the blood supply that feeds the tumors. I want everybody here to maybe start reading and learning and telling people about how CBD and THC can actually kill cancer cells. Um, and we're trying to get a study up and running um, treating post-traumatic stress disorder with, with cannabis, and we're meeting with a lot of resistance from the government on this. Um, there are a thousand people a month right now attempting suicide who are veterans. These guys are in really bad shape, and it's important that we reach out and try to help them. And if it turns out the cannabis can help them, then fine. What's great about cannabis is you can grow it in your own backyard. This, it's very subversive, right? I mean, this is, this is a medicine you can make yourself. You don't need to see the doctor. You don't need to get, pay Big Pharma any money. Um, and hemp can make America great again. <laughs> This is, you guys all know how useful this plant is, you know, not just for fabrics and everything else, but it's a, it's a, the seeds are a total vegetarian protein, and the oil is a biofuel, and it grows in every state in the country, and it could be our biggest export, and it could, it helps with the environment. I mean, it's such a no-brainer. It's just kind of crazy. Um, you know, the... The thing I always say about, about our nation's drug policy is, um, as a psychiatrist, that, it, um, it's crazy. These guys are crazy. You know, the only reason, you know, this is a medicine. It's got all these great things going for it. And what's the problem? It makes you smile. It makes you laugh. It makes you happy. God forbid, you know, we should be happy with our medicine and rely a little bit less on big pharma and doctors like me to give you your daily dose. Thank you very much.